Host, and I'm joined this week in a very special edition of the Perpcast because we're not going to go for any news or reviews or anything like that. We're just going to have a straight one-on-one talk. And I am joined by Kevin Joyce from VR Focus and AdMix. How are you doing, Kev? Hi, how's it going? Yeah, really good, man. Really good. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. I know you only got a little bit of time here, so uh, it's really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us. No problem. I've been looking forward to it. So uh, we're just going to basically talk a bit about your time at VR Focus. We're going to talk about your current job as well at AdMix. But we'll start with your time at VR Focus. Because I know a lot of people probably know you best from there. So I guess for me, for the first major question I had is what, how did you get started with VR Focus and what was kind of your background as a, as a games journalist? Sure. Uh, so prior to VR Focus, I, I ran a, a network of independent uh, websites. We covered, we had a, a core site that covered the whole industry and then lots of spin-off sites that dedicated that uh, space to individual platforms. So we had the, the main site, which was Electronic Theatre, and then uh, spin-off sites such as Metro Gaming, which was during the Metro Interface days of the Xbox 360, Windows Phone. Own Windows PCs and that dedicated that space. We had a dedicated PlayStation site, dedicated Nintendo site, so on and so forth. And the same team worked across individual sites. Say, for example, we'd have an Xbox 360 game uh, for review. One team member would write the core review for Electronic Theatre, another one would write it for Metro Gaming, another one would write it for the Xbox spin-off site, so on and so forth. And we had a really good system going uh, where uh, basically everybody in the company got to play everything that came out and everybody had a voice mm. um, to share their opinion. So someone who was like, the core, for example, uh, a first-person shooter, the core first-person shooter reviewer would also get to play platforming games and, and give their their vote on how it compared to other games that they experienced. And we'd uh, share what we found unique about the games. And so we had a, a, yeah, a really nice system going. And I did that for, as I say, about 10 years around that network. And wow. uh, I grew up a bit, I got a bit older and, uh, you know, had a family and uh, things got a bit more complicated. And uh, I kind of decided that I'd, I'd done all I could with that. And so an opportunity came up with, uh, it was actually Patrick uh, Olinick, the CEO of Endreams, who I first mm. discussed uh, launching uh, a VR website. Mm. And essentially his, his view on it was that uh, VR was coming of age and uh, he wanted to help support VR growth in Europe. And there was no VR website in Europe. Uh, in fact, at the time, there was only one reasonable sized VR website, which was Road to VR, who are obviously still going today and are still one of the leading websites. And aside from that, there was no one writing about VR. So we talked about setting up VR Focus and mm. uh, a few months after our initial conversations we, we launched. So, so the site was basically founded in the very very early days of VR I mean what sort of titles were available then I guess it was literally like when when Oculus first appeared on the market right? And, and yeah why? so uh, it was just after the Oculus Kickstarter a couple months after that so uh, DK1 it was the original Oculus mm. not the original Oculus development kit but the first one the DK1 um, that was available at the time so there was no uh, depth tracking or anything like that it was a, essentially a freed off experience um and it was you know it was a bulky uh, piece of kit and uh wasn't wasn't the best vr experience but it was the first thing that most people saw as an insight into the promise that vr is and still is today it's still not obviously still far from fulfilling that promise of taking you to distant worlds and uh you know exploring the metaverse in the way that we all hope but it's show it, it's it's ever in, improving from that landmark moment the dk1 and uh so at the time the kind of software we could experience i mean my first experience uh with vr was the as most people with the DK1, uh, was the Tuscany uh, Villa. Mm, mm, wow. <laughs> a, very, a very simple uh, DK1 experience. But it, again, that, like I say, that promise of taking you to distant worlds, I've never visited Tuscany. Yeah. But six years ago, I did for the first time in an Oculus room. <laughs> yeah, obviously, we had the Oculus Share uh, platform at the time as well, where independent yeah. developers could create very small or even larger, but uh, mostly very small experiences just to test out whether things were working or not in VR and put them up on Oculus Share for free. And uh, my first few months of uh, VR focus while I was trying to find out what, what it was that people wanted from a VR website, where the hole in the market was and what the audience were looking for. I let, went through everything, literally everything that was on Oculus Share. Mm. And right up till the day it was it was taken away, uh, I would play almost everything that was released on that platform. And some of it made me very, very ill. 
and some of it was absolutely amazing and I still wish existed to these, this day. We chatted to uh, Ian at Eurogamer a few weeks back and he was saying how the difficulties of getting traffic on VR, for VR on major mainstream websites. And I suppose that must have been a major challenge for you to find out what exactly people would have been interested to learn about VR at, at such an early stage because it's it's obviously such a, an encompassing medium and there are so many different types of game that can work and some that don't really work so well in VR. So what was kind of the process behind discovering that and discovering the things that really worked and didn't? So um, as I say, prior to VR Focus, I was a more traditional gaming journalist. And so I had already experienced the Oculus Rift and knew of the Kickstarter and such, uh, but I hadn't dug deep on it. But I'd done a bit of VR coverage on, on other gaming sites, uh, but uh, but I hadn't dug deep onto what VR was and what it could be. So when VR Focus came around, uh, I did a lot of research into the audience that already existed, those that were going out and buying DK1, people were back at Kickstarter, talking on Reddit, talking on Twitter, anywhere I could find people who were already part of the VR community. And uh, those were the kind of people who I was reaching out to saying, you know, if there was this uh, media outlet coming up. What what kind of stuff would you want to read? What what do you want to hear about? What can't you find anywhere else? And uh, it was it was the news. Uh, Road to VR do a fantastic job of uh, in depth analysis of hardware. Um, and we weren't even going to come close to that. Uh, so uh, I wanted to go a very different route. And uh, I truly believe uh, back then I believed it, and I still believe it now that it is gaming that's going to lead VR. There are all sorts of things that you can do with modern VR. Uh, all sorts of industries it's going to be a massive boon to uh, whether it be healthcare or architecture or, or education uh, anything you can name VR is going to impact it in some way but it's going to be it's going to be video games that are going to lead the lead, lead the mad rush for VR because it's gamers that are willing to adopt new technologies much quicker hmm. so we decided or I decided uh, that uh, VR focus needed to be uh, a website that first and foremost was a gaming website covering news and it was really nice about a year after we launched uh, I was interviewed by Kent Bai who does the voices of VR podcast that I'm sure you've you've listened to. Yeah. Um, and in the first uh, interview he, uh, I, I did with him, he referred to us as the uh, the newsbeat website for VR. Yeah. And that was it was really nice to have someone else who was also in the field of peer of mine, essentially having who I'd never met but prior to that. Uh, he had sat there and read VR Focus mm. and understood what we were trying to be and what we were trying to achieve. Um, yeah. And so that's what VR Focus has become. It started off as a, an idea for a VR website, and it's it's proved to be popular. And so. It's stayed there. But I notice a lot of the f- things that you do now on the website, obviously the website has changed a lot over time. Features are a big part of the work that you do. You obviously do a lot of reviews and previews. Like I saw that you actually covered Pixel Rips just recently, the new Pixel Rip that's coming out. So, I mean, wh- when did you kind of transition to do more things? Like how did the site grow from just, be- just being a standard VR news site to maybe growing into more features and, and really deep diving into games and looking into the wider industry? So we always would, were reaching, uh, reaching, making an effort to do hands-on, hands-on previews. Um, Um, But I have a a very strict philosophy uh, when it comes to reviews in that we cannot put a score on a game until a product is available to buy. So um, unless a game is is officially released on a PlayStation Store or once it leaves early access on Steam, once the developer says this is now audience ready that's when we can put a score on it. that's when it's this is what you will buy so there was a couple of years where VR, when VR Focus first launched before any hardware was commercially available uh, when it was just all hands on previews and analysis uh, there was no actual reviews as such but uh, but we always had that uh, that underlying curve of like this is what's coming up this is how this game is progression but there were some some games that I played five, six, seven, eight times uh, prior to launch because they were in development for so long and VR still hadn't launched um, so we would do update pieces on how the game's progression. Well, once commercial hardware became commercially available, well, we could start putting a score on things. I think, uh, obviously, the, mm. the ethos changed. By that point, the team had grown from just uh, just starting uh, myself and uh, just before launch, or just after launch, sorry, another writer, a second writer, Jamie, came on board. Um, and by that point, uh, we'd obviously grown to like five people and eventually got up to seven. Um, and so we had more more scope, more bandwidth to take on deeper features and um, many more reviews. There was a point uh, when when VR was uh, about a year old uh, and uh, our team had matured a lot that we were doing a review almost every day because there was so much software coming out. As as time's gone on, we uh, we decided to streamline the approach to reviews. And uh, what we what we tend to do now is we we run a middle ground between those reviews that our audience desperately want. Mm. 
and those that we think are interesting and they should, it's hard to say, guide them, but uh, yeah. make people aware that there are more options out there than just the tr- next AAA game coming Yeah, out. absolutely. And I think that's something that we found as well. The big driving force in VR has been the independent drive, definitely. And uh, we, we, we always say that while a lot of big AAA studios are supporting VR and they've done some fantastic jobs, I mean, if you look at Skyrim VR, it's incredible. But I mean, a lot of the major big upcoming titles have come from independent studios. Sometimes it's the first game they've ever made. You, you're, you're absolutely right. It, that, that is where the drive for VR is coming from. And I suppose that's the interesting thing as well. And talking a bit about that, with VR, we've been finding a lot, of, there's been a real rise of influencers uh, covering the games and video, uh, really sort of demonstrating the kind of like the, 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 the visual approach of games and that people feeling that's a way of connecting with those games. So how did you feel about initially talking about VR as just a writ in a written medium? And how have you noticed that transition move towards video or have you not, have you not noticed that transition so much? I know definitely it was always my intention to hire video producers when we first started VR Folk because I've am uh, got to be honest I'm getting a bit old now a bit, a bit long in the tooth I don't really know how to use YouTube it kind of passed me by that one so obviously I you know I know what my personal strengths and weaknesses are so when we were hiring a, a video producer we wanted somebody who, who could work YouTube who could tell me what we need to be doing uh, I would give them a, a remit as to how I think it needs to be approached and they go away and do it someone who knows the, the platform and the, that audience better than I do yeah so we've hired a, a couple of presenters over the years, uh, people who would literally do two camera pieces uh, about VR and their VR experiences. And those uh, uh, those have performed quite well. Um, we did, uh, for a while, we did um, a series called VR TV, where we had uh, a presenter in a studio s- scenario and we had guests on who would, uh, you know, um, uh, they would talk about the latest news and also what they're working on. And it was like a, a Saturday night talk show format, essentially. And um, that, was, that was met with a, a very keen reception when it first launched but the audience tailed off very quickly uh, so we decided to, to bring the scale down and make it more frequently and we found that that works much better and it's gone to the point now where we make a, a lot of video content which doesn't ha- actually have a presenter it's, it's, it's just uh, instant hits of this is what this is this is when it's coming out this is where you can get it and people absolutely love that format it is more of a natural medium I think for for VR but it also doesn't fully encompass the uh, the, se- the sense of depth and scale like I think we, again I discussed this with Ian at Eurogamer a few weeks ago uh, how we found that with video you can you see you see a, you, a visual representation of what you are seeing on the screen but you don't get that feeling of being able to literally tilt your head just a slight couple of inches either way and get that feeling for the freedom of visual movement of vr and actually getting that sense of feeling as if you're you're in a place and immersed in that in that scenario so but it, it does feel like to me it's it's a natural way for people to get as close as possible to it but writing can also take you there as well and it kind of like illustrates some of that depth and representation of what vr can do i read the mediums yeah. uh, are perfect at expressing exactly what VR is. And uh, I mean, I love Ian's work, obviously. I've known Ian for many years and I love what he does at Eurogamer and his VR coverage. Uh, but obviously the audiences between Eurogamer and VR Focus are very different. Well, one well, is a lot of crossover. Mm. 90% of VR Focus's audience is people that have experienced VR, who know what it is. Mm. So we don't have the issues that Ian has where he has to explain what, you know, how it feels because uh, our audience have a headset. They, they know how it feels. And we just tell them why this one is, but it feels better than that one. Or, or this is something new that uh, they, they haven't tried yet, but they can gather what it's going to be like. Because, for example, um, there was a demo many, many years ago, I'm sure you've tried it, the Crescent Bay demo, where a dinosaur walked down a museum hallway over the top of you to give you a, a sense of scale. Yes, yes, another one. But at the time, that was super impressive. It was like, oh, wow, this is, you know, I, I, the sense of scale is really immense. But since then, there have been numerous games which not only have had this big creature coming towards you, but also giving you a gun to shoot you, or it's, it's started trying to trample you as you've been going around, and you can physically feel the space it's in as well, as same as the space that you're in, this shared space with this ginormous thing. And now if you go back and play that old demo, it seems, you know, bland in comparison. Mm. And the people who VR Focus was addressing will have been people that understand that that's how VR progresses. VR now is very different to a year ago, two years ago, five years ago. It's an ever-changing medium. And I suppose that sort of follows on to my like, sort of last question I want to ask you is like, as a bigger part of the industry, how does VR move forward from here? I mean, obviously we've got PlayStation VR. The rumors about PlayStation VR 2 are, are ever growing. Rumors about Xbox getting involved. Uh, obviously Oculus Quest is, is, is a game changer this year. You know, how does the medium, I guess, crack that mainstream? Even further. The Oculus Quest uh, really is a, a strong contender for this, for, for this next stage. I, I honestly still think it's going to be at least another four or five years until we crack mainstream, uh, as you say. But in terms of growing the audience that exists, Oculus Quest is in a really nice position. 
It's the same kind of price as a, as a video game console. There are no new console launches this holiday season. It is the, the go-to gaming present of this uh, of this holiday season. I, I, I genuinely believe that Oculus Quest has ticked all the boxes it, it, it needs to tick to be, you know, to, to, to help push the medium forward. I, I see that Vive is struggling a little bit, or at least I believe they're struggling a little bit, to find where they exist in the market now that the index has come out and is the super high end and the Quest is the middle tier and then PlayStation VR is arguably the, the bottom of the high end if you if you get what I mean. Vive is struggling a little bit and I, I want to see what they're doing what, what they're going to be doing next. There's all sorts of talk about different kind of tracking technologies and smell visors and things like that and I, I don't know if that's really something that's going to attract new people. What is going to attract new people though is is just deep immersive experiences. The more people that get the chance to try uh, VR, uh, as, as I heard you say on, on Ian's uh, podcast, the more people that try these experiences, the more people that are going to get uh, blown away by what VR can do. And the quest is at a price point that is attractive enough that if one good game, if one big game that they are interested in comes to that format, it's an easy purchase now. It's not like buying a PC and a Rift and having to set, go through complicated installation procedures, uh, which to be frank, I mean, I've worked with video games for, as I say, like 50 years now and I still find the rift annoying to set up at times if you've got a stationary setup that's fine but if you're taking it somewhere it can and the vibe obviously is even worse but with the quest you just whack it on and go and there's yeah. nothing better than that uh, the, 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 I, I'm willing to take the sacrifice in graphical fidelity in exchange for being untimed. Yeah. And it's funny you, you say that because people say that with a Switch and the sort of slightly separate subject, but people are very happy to have a game portably at the risk of losing, you know, the 1080p, the 60 frames a second. And and, and there is definitely a market of people who love that element of convenience over the the height, the, the most effective possible experience that you can have. The most, it's, it's fascinating. It's a fascinating time for sure. And I feel like you, like you say, Quest is driving that. As a guy who's uh, on, a, on a 12-hour flight about every 20 days, I couldn't live without my Switch. <laughs> So, so I'm, t- I'm totally on board with that. Yeah, and I suppose that sort of links me on to uh, what you're currently doing because uh, obviously I know you've been, you, you say you've been working in games for 15 years and you're working on VR Focus for a very, very long time. And I, I know you're still very much a big part of that, uh, but you obviously have a team to facilitate a lot of the day-to-day stuff you don't VR Focus. But you're currently working uh, for AdMix. Uh, can you tell us a bit about what you do there and what, what AdMix is essentially? Sure. So uh, I'll start with the what AdMix is so people can understand when I say what I do there. Um, but AdMix is a, is a platform for non-intrusive advertising in VR. So essentially what that is, is uh, I always uh, have the explanation of, uh, if you imagine a city street, you're playing a, a 3D game in third person on a city street. Now, on a traditional mobile game, uh, you would have the banner across the bottom of the screen or an interstitial that would pop up every five seconds, minute, whatever. And it would take you away from the experience and you'd have to close down the ad or, or just leave it there and ignore it. Obviously, now in VR, that's not going to work. That's going to take you right out of the experience. It's going to break the immersion completely. So what AdMix does is it, it's a platform, a, a plugin that you can download that as a developer, you can essentially create areas in your game where ads can exist within the world. So on that example of a city street, you can create billboards. So uh, when a gamer is walking, when a player is playing your game and walking down the street, the ad exists as part of the world, opposed to flashing up in front of their face. So it's like those sci-fi movies of old. That- That's it. Yeah, completely. When, when, when AI becomes a, a mainstream thing you'll see admix holograms everywhere uh, it's gonna it's gonna become all blade runner in <laughs> but yeah so that's that's what admix does admix is uh, the idea behind admix was to uh, because of the fact that vr has obviously got a very slow adoption curve right now uh, we're not yet at the, hopefully the quest is as we just discussed uh, at that inflection point when it becomes uh, uh, an easy buy for a mainstream audience but because we haven't hit that point yet the the revenues uh, for a lot of developers are obviously still very low so the idea of admix was to uh, help developers fund what comes next from them with a continual revenue stream. And that obviously is done through uh, through monetization, through advertising. So a developer who, say, wants to charge $40 for their game but may realize actually that audience doesn't exist, that that's going to allow me to make make my money back the money I've invested in this creation isn't going to come back from charging $40 maybe they only want to charge $5 or not charge at all and instead make their revenue through uh, through advertising that's uh, put into their game in a non-intrusive way there's, there's always been this uh, barrier about uh, in-game advertising in, the, in a non-VR in the traditional games industry uh, does it work is it good la 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 I, I myself was never opposed to it as long as it was done in a way where it didn't affect the gameplay for example in a, a football game you could have banners around a stadium anyway Anyway, uh, why not allow developers to make more money and hopefully 
in exchange make better games because of it. So I never really had a problem with it, but obviously mobile games have changed the landscape completely. Mm. Um, the amount of free-to-play games that exist on mobile, whether it's through in-app purchases or advertising, mm. it's phenomenal, the amount of them that are out there. And so the, the hope is that more content of a higher quality can be produced in VR by copying a similar model. Because uh, advertising is a big part of websites these days. I mean, people who visit a website, they will see some form of advertising at some point. They'll see a lot of advertising on the television, which is obviously a standard that has been used for many, many years. But as a, as a journalist coming from a journalistic background, I mean, what was kind of the lure for you to to, to get into an agency that, that, that specialises in doing that? Oh, so, uh, so my role is actually nothing to do with the advertising whatsoever. Okay. So, uh, yeah, my role at AdMix, uh, as the lead evangelist, is my job title. Essentially, what, what I do is I reach out to developers working in the space and find out what it is that they need to help, essentially help boost their, their efforts, their, whether it be additional sales or uh, boosting their um, uh, notoriety or whatever it may be. What I, I try and find a way to facilitate through the assets we have. And obviously the assets we have are VR Focus, a new website I launched recently, uh, VRARpioneers.com, which is a um, uh, essentially a peer-to-peer website where development studios who already work in AR and VR will write about their experiences or problems they've had that they found solutions to, so on and so forth, with the hope that other developers will be able to read or watch that content and, and learn from it and take away a lesson for their own their own benefit um yeah. and obviously we we also uh host uh booths at events and sometimes we can offer these booths to developers to showcase their wares or, or, or generally uh, there's a lot of uh yeah. doctor doc that i'm doing as well making introductions because obviously i i know a lot of people in vr so making connections is a big part of my role as well and uh all of this is facilitated by the fact that admix are just giving me the remit to just go out and get to know people which is a great yeah. great job to have to be honest i guess that's where, where i was leading to next i mean what what are your sort of day-to-day responsibilities? So t- talk me through a day uh, at AdMix for you. How, how does that, what does that look like? Uh, so every day is incredibly different. I know a lot of people say that, <laughs> but it, it honestly is. So uh, I, have, I have been in the office for, uh, this counts in the weekend we just had, this is a Monday this has been recorded on. This counts in the weekend. I have been in yep. the office for three days running. And that is the longest I've been in the office for about three months. <laughs> So I basically, uh, so my role uh, today on one of my days in the office, I have been reaching out to developers who uh, I recently met at Oculus Connect and trying to find out, as I say, what, what it is that they need, what it is, what kind of help they need, and if there's anything I can do to assist them. Uh, one of the things that I'm, I'm doing, I've got coming up is uh, I, I work on a lot of case studies. These are like essentially studio profiles. So a developer who uh, has, has some time available and wants to uh, network within the community, uh, I, I will help promote their products in any way I can and in exchange they will do a little bit of promotion for AdMix so I'll travel to their studio and they will put the plugin into their experience and showcase how you know how easy it is to do AdMix how to use AdMix how they can tailor the ads so that they blend into the environment and use all different kinds of shaders so that nothing stands out so we uh, we do this uh, dual kind of production where um, they get com- uh, not on VR Focus VR Focus remains completely independent but on the network I have through VIAR Pioneers we get a, a video piece like a of why they exist and how they use admix and then also a, a studio profile a five to seven hundred word article on, on why they're in the industry what they the reasons why they believe that vr or ar is going to be the next big wave today i've been working on arranging a few of those and later this week i'll be at awe and then the following week i'll be traveling to wherever these studios may be to go and record these case studies so uh yeah sorry, office time for me is it's very limited the nice thing is well you get to see a lot of different parts of the world and you get to see people at work which must be really refreshing to see how how they how, how they create these experiences and how they uh, are, are, they've sort of the environments that they've cultivated as well when where they work it's must be really nice to see that I, I really uh, yeah I, I travel to a lot of uh, different countries and uh, uh, go to a lot of different studios and for some reason I really like the the way they work in Sw- in Sweden I, I really oh, like the, yes. the shoes off studio culture I don't know why. Um, yeah. but, uh, but I really do I really do like uh, what they do uh, obviously fast travel games resolution games and the like yeah. Um, so yeah uh, I get to see a lot of different places and, uh, and uh, it's really nice as well when you actually play the final experience and seeing that, that what influenced them and their local uh, just little touches that uh, help you realise you know where this has come from where the inspiration has come from and, uh, and the reactions developers have as well when they see you play the game for the first time and things like they're doing something I never thought would be possible or they're really enjoying this thing and, and, and it's that sense of pride that you sometimes catch at the corner of their eye or you know it's it's lovely it's uh, you really see you really see 
that authenticity uh, on display? Uh, obviously, because I've, I've been in VR for so long and, and played almost everything that there is in VR, a lot of developers are very keen to have me uh, try their experiences. Mm. You can you can imagine how many kinds of games I've played, and I've, I've played them from when they were just grey boxes floating around the screen right up until the final release product. And uh, I'm, always, I'm always happy to give honest yeah. feedback. Uh, I've had a few developers who I've clashed with because I'm just so brutally honest, uh, but they always thank me in the end. So it's a, it's a really nice position that I'm in where I can, uh, uh, you know, honestly uh, put my experience to the test when I'm trying new new VR games and, and experiences. Yeah, and I suppose that's quite an interesting point because you have come from a journalistic background and because you, ha- you are one of the most experienced VR journalists of at the moment because of VR is still a very infantile technology and it's still growing all the time and there's there, there are there are very few people on, on your side of the fence. So, um, I mean, do, do people find that when you do come to studios that there's almost like a consultancy kind of approach there? Is, is that something you offer with Admix or is that something you try to keep separate? Or So consultancy is going a bit far. Um, I, I don't. I don't feel like uh, I could ever tell a developer how to develop their game. I always used to say when I did uh, traditional games journalism before VR that um, I could tell you what was wrong with your game, but I couldn't tell you how to fix it. <laughs> and uh, that, that's pretty much the same position I am. In, I'm in with VR. I can, I can go to a developer and I'll play there through their game and I'll tell them what I liked and didn't like and what I noticed and what I feel doesn't quite work at that moment in time mm. but I couldn't I wouldn't have the audacity to say that your creation is wrong and this is what you need to do to it no absolutely and not so uh, yeah as, uh, I wouldn't say it's a consultancy kind of role but uh, I do I do like to feel that um, I, c- I can have uh, offer them a different perspective something that may, yeah. they may not have thought about because they're so deep in it. I think that's 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 the beauty of it. People come into the studios and it's, it's almost an outsider infiltr- who offers a perspective. Infiltrating is a good word. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah they, like you say, they, they're so ingrained in, in what they do that it's always refreshing to have that alternative perspective. And I think that's why a lot of people like going to trade shows. And I suppose, but in terms of what, what the work you do with different developers, you, you obviously have different opportunities, so to speak. So there's very different games on the market. And I suppose that sort of leads me to thinking, well, how do you choose Choose what to advertise. What types of different adverts do you have that would suit a particular product? So, uh, so as I say, I'm not uh, involved in the advertising side of Admix, uh, but obviously I do know how it runs. So, essentially, what happens is Admix connects to a series of DSPs, who are basically uh, they are the the companies that work with the advertisers to bring campaigns into into games. Hmm. And what Admix does is it offers up the inventory. So if you were building a racing game, for example, you would create a couple of spaces in your game uh, where you are happy for adverts to be filled in those spaces. And then you were and then Admix would sell those on your behalf. And uh, in our back end on the on the Admix platform, you can uh, define what kind of advertising is suitable, whether it be entertainment or arts or anything you can think of. There's there are categories that drill down to what you think is suitable. And then so uh, an Admix will take that as part of the package and work with the DSPs to find an advert that matches that proposition. And it, it's, it's all programmatic, so there's no hard baking or anything. There's no uh, uh, uploading JPEGs or anything yeah. stupid like that into your application. It's all programmatic, so it's generated on the fly. There's a, uh, I can't remember exactly how long, it's like two microsecond bidding war that happens every time an advert wants to be injected into your game. And uh, yeah, that's basically how it works. As, as a developer, if you if you download the plugin and install it in your game and create placements, obviously the idea is that it'll gener- generate revenue when the yeah. consumer sees an advert in your game. And it's all uh, impression-based. So it's the same as uh, advertising on a website. Um, the more people that play your game, the more people that see the advert in your game, the more revenue you generate. That's an interesting point. Then from a consumer point of view, I mean, do, do you feel like there is a risk that uh, a consumer may feel a bit off-put by that? Or it, it, how, how do you feel that the response would be to that? So as I said earlier, I've never been against in-game advertising as long as it's handled well. And uh, what, what we do with Admix is the idea is that developers Developers have complete control over where the adverts exist, uh, how right. they look, how they feel. So if a, if a developer is going to have the audacity to slap a load of adverts right from the player as soon as they start the game, then people are going to be turned off and not play their game. So the impetus is on the developers to make sure that the adverts work well within their environment. That's the whole point of Admix, it's non-intrusive. So uh, putting a load of uh, banners in front of a, a game a player as soon as they start the game is not a good idea. But blending them into your environments, uh, making them so that they... Uh, uh, in some games, obviously, as I used the example of a city scene earlier and a racing scene, but yeah. having adverts in those games actually brings them closer to reality because in those experiences and those real world locations, you would have advertising. Yeah. 
Um, so we have some developers that are working on similar uh, similar kind of projects uh, and mm. uh, football titles, American football titles, all sorts of different things, boxing games, where actually having uh, real world adverts. Uh, it, it actually increases the reality of the experience, the, the realism that they've got. Um, so the impetus is very much on developers. The adverts can be sh- shaped and sized and uh, colorized and tailored however they feel that the adverts work within their world. In terms of that, uh, have, you, have you noticed any developers that have kind of adapted their experiences purposely to incorporate ad mix advertising? Uh, or is that just purely that it's just been happen- happenstance that, that there's always been that option to, to incorporate it in some way? That yeah, it- no, I've not, I've not actually come across any developers that have changed their experience to incorporate AdMix. As I say, AdMix has a lot of customization features. So they have worked hard to make sure that the adverts aren't offensive, aren't, you know, uh, right in a player's face. Uh, they don't break the level of immersion. So they work hard on that size. But I haven't come across anyone that's gone, oh, well, we're going to redesign this level to generate more impression. That, that would be silly. That would be completely against the reason why AdMix exists. Well, I suppose for a final question on AdMix, I mean, what's what's kind of, would you say, was the company's aim for the next five years? And almost, do you see it trying to raise the credibility in the VR space? Do you see it trying to kind of raise even further awareness? I mean, what would you say was the key driving goal for the company moving forward? So the, the raison d'etre for AdMix um, is, is as I say, is to support developers. Um, we actually have a big logo on our wall, which uh, literally has the words empowering developers. Mm. And the idea is to help developers uh, generate revenue early on in VR when there isn't that big an audience so that they can continue to create uh, amazing VR and AR experiences. Uh, that's that's the, the, the sole reason that AdMix exists. Uh, me personally, as a part of AdMix, uh, my my goal is to help VR grow, is to reach out to developers and give them any kind of support I possibly can. And I, I do encourage anyone that listens to this, if you're working on a VR game, feel free to reach out to me directly. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, email, you can catch me anywhere. And I will listen to what you have to say see if there's anywhere that I can help out, anything that I can do. Well, this was a real lot of fun, Kevin. It was really, really nice to chat to you and find out more about what you're doing and what you've done. And uh, obviously, it's really great to kind of get a feel for what, what, the, what the landscape is like for both AdMix and for VR Focus going forward. So I really appreciate you taking the time to chat to us. Thanks, Ray. It's been great. So yeah, want any of your questions answered during a future show, reply in the comment section below or send us a message on your preferred social platform and we'll do our best to answer them. You could even win yourself some goodies. What would you like to see in future Pipcasts? Sound up below in the comment section as we're looking to make this a show that's informative and interesting to you as possible. You can find Pit Games on Facebook, tweet us at Pit Games, subscribe on YouTube using the link in the description below. You can also find us on Discord, Instagram, LinkedIn, and get all the latest news on our products on pitgames.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.